joy to find work that uh, feels to me as if it justifies uh, every ounce of energy that I can pour into it. So it is what you decide to do with the obstacles that life uh, throws in your path that matters the most. Secondly, among all the words of advice that I received when I was a student, there was one bit of advice that one of my teachers gave that has stuck with me all through my life. He said, we all face the same choice in life over and over again. It is a choice between the hard right and the easy wrong. All of us know, if we pause and reflect, that there is that little voice that is faint, but always there. It is always, always a mistake to ignore that little voice. Listen to it and distinguish it from the constant noise in your rationalizing mind. And as you practice, you may find it easier to discern the good advice that is always with you. Third, happiness is most often found in serving others. I know that sounds like a bromide, but there is voluminous research that now shows that to be scientifically valid. Fourth, avoid at all costs hatred and resentment. The greatest political leader I ever met in my life, Nelson Mandela, once wrote, resentment is like drinking poison and hoping that it will kill your enemies. Fifth, be kind whenever you can. One of the secrets of the human condition is that suffering binds us together. And you have no idea what burdens are being carried by the people you encounter in your life. When I think about regrets in my life, I don't have too many, but the ones that stand out from time to time, I think of them, involve a lack of kindness. Small exchanges, if I enumerated them, you would be surprised at how trivial they might sound to you. But I remember them. Now a few words about uh, our democracy. As President Lowe's uh, comments about the class of 1968 uh, illustrates, there is greater resilience in our democracy than we often fear. We have survived uh, turmoil and division and grave dangers uh, in our past. However, I have come to believe that American democracy is at this moment in much graver danger than many now assume. Our greatest hope <laughs> I could elaborate, but we don't want to go there today. Our greatest hope lies with you and your generation. Now, I'm, I'm keenly aware that commencement speakers often say something like, you are the generation that must go forward and redeem and save our world. And I know it's a cliche, but I want to put forward a challenge, however implausible it might sound. Because of the grave danger our democracy faces, I would like to challenge you and your generation to overturn one of the accepted truisms in American democracy. Namely, that young men and women between the ages of 18 and 29 simply do not register to vote and vote 
in the way that older people do. Think for a moment how you, I'm sure, like me, have been inspired by the high school students at Marjorie, Dugman, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. They are now campaigning to register young people to vote. I want to add my voice to theirs. I want to challenge you to do what so many feel is impossible. What if in this year and in the years immediately following, something truly extraordinary happened? that on social media and in conversations that you have with your peers all across this country, an American youth movement began and swept this country and grew with passion and determination to the point where young people decided that they will register to vote and will vote in unprecedented numbers and reclaim the integrity of American democracy. I remember when I was 13 years old being inspired by President John F. Kennedy when he announced America's determination to put a man on the moon and bring him back safely within 10 years. And I remember how many in my parents' generation said that was likely to be impossible. But eight years and two months later, Neil Armstrong set foot on the moon. And in the moment he did so, there was a great cheer that went up in mission control in NASA's facility in Houston, Texas. And the average age of the systems engineers in that room was 26, which means, among other things, when they heard that challenge, they were 18. They decided to acquire the skills and experience to enable them to be a part of successfully meeting that challenge. I know that it's unlikely. I know that it is implausible. But America has done the impossible before, and never has this been more needed than now. We have to reclaim not only the integrity of our voting system, but also the integrity of our system of democratic discourse. We have to reclaim respect for reason. We have to reclaim the vitality of journalism and our news media. Today we have a fifth column in the fourth estate. Organizations that pretend to be journalistic organizations, but which are actually propagandists with an ideological agenda, which often leads them to intentionally distribute falsehoods. We have the means to fix this problem, and fixing it is necessary in order to fix our democracy. Finally, I would like to talk about the climate crisis. I spoke on this campus two years ago about this challenge, and I want to tell you that in the intervening time, we have made tremendous progress. We still face a daunting threat in the relationship between humanity and our planet. There are now 7.62 billion of us on the Earth. We use technologies with power that vastly exceeds a million-fold 
the technologies that our parents and grandparents were familiar with. And we too often rely on a short-term way of thinking that numbs us to the future consequences of our present actions in our economy as well. We fail to measure the full consequences of the choices we make. Pollution is described as a negative externality, which is economists speak for you don't have to worry about it. We are using our atmosphere as an open sewer, free of charge for those who dump 110 million tons of heat trapping, man-made global warming pollution into it every 24 hours. We also ignore positive externalities, that is, the benefits of investments in public goods like education, like health care, like family services, like community services, like mental health care. We also ignore the depreciation of natural resources that replenish themselves naturally at a rate that is very slow compared to our assault upon resources like topsoil and groundwater and forests and wetlands and perhaps most important of all the web of biodiversity with which we share this planet. The fourth thing we ignore and do not measure is the distribution of incomes and net worths. So we have seen the most dramatic rise in inequality in modern history. And when most of all the new national income goes to the very top of the income ladder, this makes us vulnerable to resentment, makes our country vulnerable to the politics of authoritarian populism. We have to reclaim our own destiny by measuring what really matters to our future, starting with a decision to reduce the global warming pollution. The consequences, of course, are very clear. Since I spoke here last, Houston, Texas was struck last summer by a hurricane that dropped five feet of rain in five days. Imagine the full flow of Niagara Falls for more than 500 days. That's what Hurricane Harvey dropped on Texas and Louisiana. And soon after, Puerto Rico was virtually destroyed. And by the way, for those of us here who are Americans, we should see it as a disgrace that our country has not helped our yeah. fellow Americans. Every night on the television news is like a nature hike through the book of Revelation. And yet, some in the news media I referred to earlier do not recognize that these dots connect and put forth the false narratives that are designed to distract. George Orwell in the last century wrote this, we are all capable of believing things which we know to be untrue. And then when we are finally proved wrong, impudently twisting the facts so as to show that we were right. Intellectually, it is possible to carry on this process for an indefinite time. The only check on it is that sooner or later a false belief bumps up against a solid reality, usually on a battlefield. We are bumping up against a solid reality with the climate crisis. We have to adjust our thinking in order to make the adjustments to our behaviors, our technologies, our politics, and our decisions. 
Now there is good news. We are making dramatic progress. The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that the single fastest growing job in the United States is solar installer. In fact, solar jobs are growing nine times faster than jobs generally in the economy. The second fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. All around the world, we are seeing the beginnings of an historic transformation of the way we use energy, the way we pursue mobility and transportation, of the way we grow and distribute food, the way we preserve forests and soil. But these changes are not yet happening fast enough. We are gaining on this problem. And one of the great achievements, which Bob Orr had a great deal to do with, was the Global Agreement in Paris, in which every nation in the world agreed to go to net zero global warming pollution by mid-century. Now, I know what you're thinking. And yes, President Trump did make a speech last year. But under the law, the first day upon which the U.S. could withdraw from the Paris Treaty is the day after the next presidential election. Which brings me back to you. And I get it. There are, I know, a great many supporters of President Trump in this audience. I do understand that. As one of his uh, supporters put it on television, he said, the way I look at it, Donald Trump is chemotherapy for America. Well, in medicine and in science, some experiments are terminated early for <laughs> I don't know that that will be the case, and I do not predict it. But I do know that whether you are a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent, the salvation of our democracy, for those who support Trump or oppose Trump or those who want other candidates or not, the salvation of our democracy is with the American people and most especially with your generation. I want to make one thing clear. I'm here to congratulate you. I'm here to thank your parents and your teachers and all those who have made this joyous day possible. But very seriously, I am also here to recruit you. Your generation has a mission ahead of it. I hope that you will find the will to succeed. And for those who doubt that you do, I will repeat that in America, the will to succeed is itself a renewable resource. Thank you and congratulations.